this semester and in a certain sense it's a bit uh trial and error because we have it a duo in person and over zoom and recorded with a video camera um so in any case the event will be recorded and um we'll see how this works the the main topic of this semester is quantum information theory and it the idea is to have that mostly student run um, the organizer is is Howie, and uh, we try to have uh, several speakers um, for certain topics. So I'll ask around on campus, and whoever is interested to contribute, please uh, let Howie or me know. Um, but the first talks will be by Howie. Later on, I will give a talk on um, geometric quantum mechanics and. Uh, the connection to quantum information theory and uh, related topics. Okay, but now let me just pass over to Howie. Thank you for organizing this and for um, willing to give a couple of talks. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. Um, yeah, so like Marcus said, the theme for the seminars this semester is quantum information theory. But for this first talk, I'm mainly going to do a bit of a comparison between the classical and the quantum case. So in the classical setup, we have some kind of state space, which I'll just label S for now. We have some kind of event algebra, a Boolean event algebra. Um, Boolean algebra, let me just say slash event lattice, because in general, it's going to be a lattice. And if you're not familiar with the term Boolean algebra, so the lattice aspect means that I have meets like intersections or conjunctions. I have ors like disjunctions or unions. And then I also have some notion of a complement. For most of this talk, I'm going to write with a superscript perp symbol. And the Boolean aspect in particular means a few things. It means that these two operations of mean join distribute over each other. And it means that all of my complements are sort of true complements in the classical sense. If I have something in its complement, they mutually cover the whole space and they don't intersect at all. So that's all we really mean by Boolean algebra. And the sort of uh, most familiar one for most people is the algebra of subsets of any given set. And we take that. And typically our Boolean algebra in the classical case might be labeled omega. It's typically the power set of our state space. Um, maybe in a continuous case, we restrict to certain measurable sets. Um, often though, we might just have a countable or finite list of events. So it's either the pro uh, it's either the power set of that or some other notion of measurable set, depending on what we need for whatever technical stuff we're trying to do. So we have an event, we take it in our event lattice, and it has some kind of probability, which for an event A, I'll just label P sub A. So classical information theory starts with the idea that we take a probability space, we want to think about all the outcomes that could happen, and the more likely an outcome is, the sort of less surprised we are when it happens, the less information is really intrinsic in that event, less information is needed to communicate that event. Whereas if an event is very rare, it's a very informative thing for that event to happen. It's very surprising. And if we wanted to sort of optimally communicate it, we would require more information for that than we would for a less, com uh, less common event. So without getting into the why necessarily of why this formula works, we take the information content of an event, which I'm just going to label I of A for now. And as I kind of alluded to, it really only depends on the probability. So I might kind of switch between saying it's the information content of the event and the information content of the probability of that event. But it's always given by log of one over that probability sometimes written negative log of the probability, and I'll start writing that here in a little bit. But this is sort of the more intuitive way to think about it. For instance, if I have a coin flip with a probability of one half, 
then the information content is log of two. And if I choose to for the base of my logarithm, I could just say it has one, so to say, bit of information. So we do that. And then we expand on that with the notion of classical entropy. So for entropy, which I'm going to denote with a capital H, H of P. Actually, let me say H of rho, where rho is some probability measure on my entire event algebra omega. By entropy, we just mean the expected value of that information content. So I have this information content function that I can think of as defined either on the probabilities or on the event structure itself. And I take the expected value of that. And for instance, in the case where it's discrete, accountable, this is really just given by the sum of all the probabilities times the log of one over that probability, right? All the information contents scaled by the probability of that event occurring. So that's our classical version of entropy. It has some nice properties. They kind of reflect this idea of trying to capture information content. For instance, the entropy of something is zero and the information content of something is zero if and only if there is some event that has probability one. So I'll just say for some A in my event algebra. So any event that's a sure thing contains zero information because no one is surprised whatsoever that that event happened. And it takes absolutely nothing to communicate that that event happened beyond just knowing what the event could be. So just some quick classical examples. If for instance, I have a state space with maybe just A, B, C, D, just to kind of label for space, there are four elements of it. And let's say that it has respective probabilities, one half, one fourth, one eighth, and one eighth. So A has a half, B has a fourth, et cetera. In the information context in A, log one over one half, aka log two. And in these cases, particularly in the classical case, it's really common to just take our logarithm to be base two, which I kind of already alluded to. So if I do take it to be base two, then I have one unit of information. And when we pick the base, we usually represent that in the units. In this case, it's log base two. So I would say I have one bit of information. If it was log base three, I'd say one trit. Later on, I'll mainly just do natural logs and we might call them nats. People say one nat of information, but ultimately it doesn't matter, right? Properties of logarithms, they're all just different constant multiples of each other. So you just kind of pick a base that's convenient for the problem you're analyzing. So the information content of this A is one bit. And if I wanted to calculate the entropy of that entire space, and maybe rho again is this probability measure assigning those probabilities to the basic states, then we've got one half of two, because log base two of one half is two, one fourth of, I'm oh, sorry, one half of one. Y'all are just going to let me make a fool of myself. One half of one, log base two of two is one, log base two of four is two, and then one eight three, one eight three, since log base two of eight is three. Add that all up, it's seven fourths, in this case, seven fourths bits. So that's our classical notion of entropy. We use this to kind of compare different probability spaces. For instance, if this was entirely uniform, it would have the maximum possible entropy for this case. In this case, it would just be two because everything would have probability one fourth. But as we vary the probabilities and different things become more sure and other things become more rare, the information uh, intrinsic in the entire space kind of decreases on average. Um, can you maybe clarify what that sum is in the entropy? Like, what are you summing over exactly? Oh, yeah, that's fair. Um, so in the general case, of course, I would need to represent this as an integral. But in a lot of cases of interest, it's just finite. And so what I'm doing is thinking that I have given some sort of enumeration of my state space 
And then I'm summing up over that where rho assigns each state SI some probability PI. Yeah. So that's all I did here. I took the probability of each and multiplied it by that, intri or that intrinsic information content. Okay. So that's the classical case. And there's one thing that's unique to this case that I want to emphasize before elaborating on the quantum case. Okay. And it's this. All events say A, B in my event algebra in a classical setup, they're what I'm going to call co measurable, which just means that, for instance, I can take any one of them, take its intersection with the other, take its intersection with the complement of the other, union those together and get back exactly what I started with. So this is exactly the notion of measurability from measure theory, right? We can take our thing, we can kind of split it or cut it via this other event and its complement, and we don't actually lose anything. So that's actually a unique property of the classical case, and that's not gonna hold in general, as you might already know if you know anything about quantum mechanics, okay? So, Let's talk about the quantum event lattice. Because, from my perspective, most of the differences come into play just in the structure of the event lattice. Okay? So, I'm just going to kind of outline some axioms for this event lattice. So, we'll say, I'll say that this event lattice is called L. And I've already kind of mentioned this, but actually I didn't want to write that. I wanted to write signature. I've already kind of mentioned this, but a lattice means that we have this meet and this join operation. We also have some kind of partial order, which I'll represent with a less than or equal to. Those are just the basic, basic ingredients of any lattice. But the quantum event lattice, okay, it's a bounded lattice. That just means that in addition, my signature contains a so-called top and bottom element, a sort of identity sitting at the top and a sort of empty set or empty event sitting at the bottom. Slattice is also complete. Complete here means not only do I have these sort of binary and by extension finitary uh, meets and joins, I have arbitrary infinitary meets and joins over any um, indexing set out i, and i can be uh, any cardinality. So when I say complete, I mean I have meets and joins now, not just binary over anything. Okay, and this lattice L is complemented. Which just in terms of the signature means that I also have some kind of complementation function taking elements of L to elements of L. And these are just sort of the, uh, the materials in the signature, I would say, of the structure. And we'll just put some axioms on that signature. And as I kind of alluded to, there's really only one major difference between our quantum event lattice and a classical Boolean event lattice. So I'll lay out some basic axioms. Most of these are satisfied even in the classical case, but then we'll have one breaking point, so to say. Okay. So as for axioms, L is atomic. This is a property a lattice can have where any element contains some sort of element below it that's an atom. So I would say for any event A, I have some phi below A such that phi is an atom. And if you don't know what that means, that just means that for any other thing, maybe I'll just say for all B, if B is strictly less 
than phi, then b was actually the bottom element. So, oh, actually, I should say, um, no, no, that's fine. Um, I, I guess I should maybe emphasize that that bottom element is also strictly less than my phi. Um, but yeah, so the idea of an atom is that my lattice has some kind of bottom element here. Everything else sits above it, but there are these things called atoms that sit directly above it and don't have anything in between them. So my lattice is atomic. In the Boolean case, that just corresponds to singleton subsets. In the quantum case, this corresponds to any kind of pure state, any kind of ray through um, any kind of ray through the unit sphere. And we also have, um, yeah, I don't think actually that follows from that. I'll just skip that. Okay. Right. We also have these properties on the complements, which sometimes people say these make the complement a so called ortho complement. These are that, um, actually, let me just say it with respect to mediation. So this complement, excludes the middle, so to say, which just means that for any event, if I look at that event and I join that event with this complement, I cover the entire thing, I get the top element back. This negation, or this complement, so to say, it's explosive, or sometimes people just say non-contradictory, which means that if I intersect anything or take the mean of anything, with its complement, I get nothing back. I get the bottom element, the trivial thing. And a sort of contraposition property that if A is less or equal to B, then B curve is less or equal to A curve. So usually these combination of properties are, afford, are, are referred to as an ortho complement properties. Of course, in the classical case, we might just say, oh, it's a complement, which is fine. But there's axioms missing here that lead people to not call it a complement all the time. So some people just prefer ortho complement for the situation where not all the other axioms of a Boolean lattice are available. Okay. In particular, there is one very well, I was going to say very obvious. It's maybe only obvious if you're familiar with a little bit of lattice theory. But there's one axiom that is pretty commonly seen on lattices that is absent here. We are not assuming distributivity. And that ends up capturing a lot of the sort of quantum weirdness, I guess we would say, of the lattice. So not assuming distributivity at all. So in general, um, actually, yeah, it's probably good if I say this. So if distributivity occurred, for instance, this meet, this intersection, what have you, would distribute over this join, and I would be able to say, oh, A join B meet C is A join B. Sorry, A meet B join C is A meet B join A meet C. If this was a distributive lattice, this would be an equality. In general, without assuming distributivity, we can only show that this meet over here on the left is in fact greater or equal to this join over here on the right. And a similar identity holds for the other case, except now switched around. So again, if it was distributed, I would say A joining this intersection is the same as A join each part and then taking an intersection. But that doesn't hold in general. But we do sort of add on these kind of these weakenings of distributivity. And since they're weakenings of distributivity, these are things that already hold in the classical Boolean case, but we kind of have to add them manually here to get something that resembles, say, the um, closed subsets of the Hilbert space, which we're sort of working up towards here. So the first kind of weakening that I'm going to consider is usually called orthomodularity. So orthomodularity is a special case where I say that if I take some event A that is contained that's less than some event B, 
then I get at least a little bit of this creativity back. In particular, I find that I can take A and I can uh, take its meat with, um, or sorry, I can take A and I can take A perp meet B. So A sits below B, and so I take everything with A, and then I take everything that's in B but not A, A perp meet B. Orthomodularity says, in this case, I do get my entire event B back. And it's not too hard to see that this is actually a special case of this distributivity property um, up here. Because since A is less than or equal to B, A join B just equals B. And then A join A perp equals the identity. So we just end up B intersects the top element, the identity, and we just get B back. So this really is a special case of distributivity. And that special case does hold. Hilbert lattices, as we'll see in a second. I'm going to talk about one extra. Did I have a question? Yeah. Yes. So, just to be clear here, you're saying distributivity would mean that those two things are equal, but yes. we're assuming not equality, but rather just the inequalities that we have there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, they, or actually, I mean, we're not even assuming these inequalities. These both hold in any lattice. That can be shown true regardless. Okay. Yeah. But getting the equalities there only holds if you explicitly assume distributivity or something equivalent to it. Right. So we're not assuming that, but we are adding some weak um, consequences of distributivity here. Yeah. And you said the example to keep in mind is both subspaces of the public space? Yeah. Okay. Um, and in fact, I can go ahead and elaborate on that since we'll get there in just a second. Um, it's not too hard to kind of think of an example, even in sort of a real case projecting down. I'll just go ahead and draw a quick picture. So let's say this is R2. And I'm going to consider maybe these three lines as the subspaces I'm going to project onto. We can see that distributivity necessarily fails if I maybe call these A, B, and C. And I want to say, okay, well, what is A join B meet C? Well, B and C meet here in this single uh, point, which is the bottom element of my lattice. The one point space is always the smallest closed subspace. So in this case, I just get A back. If I do A join B meet C, I get A back. But if I look at what I would have if I tried to distribute, so the join operation in a Hilbert lattice, Right? These are all closed subsets, closed subspaces, I should say, closed sub linear subspaces. When I take the join of these, I'm really taking the smallest closed subspace that contains them, okay. which in this finite case is just the span of these. So A join B and A join C are both the top, because in this case it's R2, so it's the entire space. So I just get the top element back. So we can just see distributivity failing here. And we can see that we have the inequality that I claim we have in general for lattices, right? A is less than or equal to that top element, but we don't have equality. So one other kind of weakening that we'll consider, we'll drop the prefix ortho and we'll just say modularity. And where to go? There it is. So this is another condition that we restrict to cases where we've got some A less or equal to B. But in this case, we say, okay, if A is contained in B, then for any C we choose, if we want to look at B meet C and join that with A, we get B meet A join C. And this is another case of distributivity because A join B would just be B. So I've kind of distributed A to B, but then simplified it down to just B. So this is so-called full modularity. However, we won't often actually assume this because this fails in infinite dimensions, whereas orthomodularity holds in all cases. But it's still useful to consider, and there's still representation theories that require at least considering what happens in the finite case. So I want to mention that regardless, okay? So these are our sort of weakenings that we have of, um, 
And these are sort of the weakenings that we have of this distributivity property. While I'm moving this up, maybe I should also mention this orthomodularity property here is exactly just the projection here in the Hilbert spaces. I can take a closed subspace. Oh, sorry, I'm up here now. I just moved it. Uh, I can take a closed subspace. I can take its orthogonal complement and they join to the whole space. That's really all this says. It's just, you know, kind of also localized to being below any particular B, but that also follows in the Hilbert space case. Okay, so. One more axiom that also holds in the classical case, and then I'll say what breaks down in the quantum case. I already mentioned that the lattice is atomic. The lattice should also satisfy the so-called atomic covering property, which just says that for any event and for any atom, which maybe I'll just call, well, I shouldn't call that P. I've been using P. I'll use P because often these things are just corresponding to some unit vector in Hilbert space anyway. So if I have some event A and I have some atom P such that that atom P does not sit below, does not sit below my A, then if I look at X, sorry, if I look at A, and I look at A join this atom P, and I look at any random event B sitting in between them, I find that for any such B, if you sit in between this A and this A join this atom, then you are actually already either equal to A or A join that atom. So this atomic covering property just says that if I take an atom that has nothing to do with the event I was originally considered, I do get something that's strictly one step larger, so to say, right? Nothing can squeeze in between this and it join this new atom. So all of these axioms I've mentioned up to this point all hold in the classical case, but here's where things break down. The quantum case also satisfies this axiom I'm gonna call irreducible or irreducibility, okay? And this says that if I take any random A and I find that A, um, actually, let me say it this way. There's really two quantifiers going on here. And if I don't get them right, I'll be mad at myself. Okay. So irreducible means that if I take any B and then I compare that with any A by taking A meet B and joining it with a meet B per, and I find that I get A back. So this is that measurability I was talking about, but now I'm saying that if I find some B that's measurable with respect to everything else, if I find a B that's measurable with respect to everything else, that B actually was trivial, and that was either the bottom element or the top element, which satisfied its trivial. So this is irreducibility. This is the one thing that sort of distinguishes the Hilbert lattice from a traditional Boolean lattice. Every single event has events that it's not co-measurable with. Every event has events that are incompatible with it. Position and momentum measurements or spin measurements in different directions or what have you. All of those things fail to split evenly over each other. Whereas in a Boolean lattice, this equality holds trivially for everything by distributivity. So failing to have full distributivity makes this axiom at least possible. And we go ahead and assume that is one of the axioms for this lattice. Okay. Now, I mentioned that axiomatic approach because there's some nice representation theorems that I want to cite now. First off, every atomic, complete, orthocomplemented, irreducible lattice comes in one of two forms. If it satisfies full modularity, then 
it is exactly a projective geometry over some division ring. A projective geometry exactly in the sense of taking that division ring and taking some, um, I was gonna say some vector space to some dimension, but I'm saying, um, I'm saying division ring, so it's not necessarily a field, so it might be a module, but regardless, you take that module to some arbitrary power of itself, and you take linear, so to say, subspaces in it, you get a projective geometry. Those correspond one-to-one -one with atomic complete, orthocomplemented, irreducible lattices. And if further, or if not further, if weaker, if we satisfy this weaker orthomodularity condition, and we satisfy the additional condition that there exists an uh, infinite ortho, well, I'll just say orthogonal sequence. So I didn't really define orthogonality in this case, but by orthogonality in the general lattice sense with all of this structure, I mean A orthogonal to B, which I will write as A per B. You can just say that means that A sits below B perp, or equivalently by contraposition, B sits below A perp. So if I have any infinite orthogonal sequence in an orthomodular atomic complete orthocomplement <coughs> irreducible lattice, then it's a theorem, and actually a fairly recent theorem going to 95 by Maria Soyer, that every such lattice corresponds to a Hilbert space over one of only three possible division rings, R, C, or the quaternions. And that's a really kind of fascinating result because there's not really anything other than purely algebraic conditions. And you're able to deduce that it necessarily has to be one of these complete fields. Now, completeness in the lattice sense is actually very similar to completeness in the sense of analysis. So, it's obviously not too much of a jump, but they are phrased entirely algebraically, so it is interesting, I think. Okay. Uh, I think it's also interesting to note that because we have these representation theorems, and again, the only difference between this and a Boolean lattice is irreducibility versus this sort of complete reducibility, already the superposition principle has presented itself, right? Already, we can only interpret this lattice as being something like a projection lattice and only as something that portably exists like closed subspaces in some sort of linear space. So the, the superposition principle just kind of presents itself naturally through these representations in terms of either vector spaces or in the case of the quaternion, the module over that. Okay. So that's the event structure. That's how that event structure differs from the classical event structure. Any other questions about that? Cool. Okay. So let's move on to probabilities. Because in the classical case, information is given by probabilities of some sort. So let's give a notion of probability on such a lattice as we have here. I'll just mean some function, I'll just call it mu. It takes the elements of my lattice, it spits out numbers between zero and one. And I don't actually have to assume very much about this function. I don't have to assume everything we normally assume in the case of classical probability. I'm just going to assume that the top element of my lattice gets assigned the probability one. And I'll assume that for any orthogonal set, so any sequence of AI such that each AI J are perpendicular when I is not equal to J satisfies that if I take the arbitrary join, because I'm complete, I can take the arbitrary join, and I take the measure of that, then I get exactly the sum of all the measures. Okay. So all I have to do is assume that. And then we can rely on Gleason's theorem from there. Gleason's theorem tells us exactly that if we have uh, 
if we have such a function, sometimes just called a state or what have you, but if we have such a function on a Hilbert lattice, and we can always represent the lattices I presented as Hilbert lattices, then any such probability function is given exactly by the Born rule, or maybe the generalized Born rule, people might say for the um, for the density matrix case. But yeah, so any such mu is given by some density matrix, which is probably the more familiar representation of probabilities in quantum mechanics, by a density matrix, which I'll call rho, and the mapping, which takes that row, or sorry, not takes that row, a mapping which takes some event A and maps it to the trace of row A. With the caveat being that I need my Hilbert space to have dimension at least three. So Gleason's theorem establishes that the only way to realize probabilities in the same way that they show up in quantum mechanics is to realize it essentially as trace of a density matrix in your space. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the infinite dimensional case, technically people don't really say density matrix, they say uh, non negative trace class operator with trace one, but that's basically just think of it like an infinite dimensional density matrix. Yeah. So let's do a few quick calculations to kind of compare the information content that exists in these kind of probability spaces to the classical case. Okay. So let's consider some quantum pure states. And just to make things a little bit concrete, I'm going to work over C2 and I'm going to give it a sort of standard basis, which kind of borrowing the notation of quantum computation, I'll write them as um, cat zero and cat one and Dirac notation. But really, I'm thinking of these, right? This is the vector zero, one, and this is the, oh, sorry, this is the vector one, zero, and this is the vector zero. Okay. So a pure state in this case, given by some, uh, some unit vector. For instance, I have a pure state represented by this vector itself. Maybe this represents the spin of some particle and zero is usually taken to be spin up. So maybe I already know this thing is spin up. I've already passed it through one measurement to gotten spin up. So I know it's in that state. So now it's in a pure state, which is represented by the density matrix that I get by doing ket zero bra zero, which in this case is just one zero zero zero. So that represents one pure state. And likewise, I have a pure state corresponding to that vector one. And that one is zero 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 one. And I'm going to introduce one more. This one is usually written as a plus, at least in the quantum computation setting. And this is just a linear combination of these two scaled so that it's still a pure state. So one over root two of these guys added together. So this corresponds to a pure state where maybe this is spin up, that's spin down, and I know that I have a 50% chance of each one occurring. Okay, so if I maybe wanted to say, let's see what happens if I am in um, this state and I want to see what the probability is of measuring this spin up. So in that case, I'm just taking the density matrix corresponding to this pure state. And I'm going to take the operation that corresponds to measuring this, but in that case, this is still just the density matrix given by that vector. So, yeah, I'll just write it with the same notation I used over there. In this case, I find that I get one half, one zero, one zero, ones across the top, row zeros across the bottom. And then I want to find the probability. So I apply my trace operator to that, and I just get one half. Okay, that's nice. That kind of represents the intuition we had going into this, right? They should have a one half probability of occurring. Okay. 
I mean, where does the zero come into play here? Like why is that? Oh, why that subscript zero? Or yeah, why the bottom subscript is row zero? Yeah. Yeah, that's just because I, I decided to label the density matrix corresponding to the pure state represented by this vector cat zero okay. with that subscript zero. Um, so I'm saying like this row zero is the density matrix associated to this pure state. Same thing with row one. And right now I'm about to use row plus to really just refer to this guy. So I could also call this guy here row plus if that density matrix. So all I'm going to do is sort of commute these guys around here. Here I did row zero, row plus. Here I'm going to do row plus, row zero. And I get something similar. I get one half, one, one, zero, zero, and then I apply my trace and I still get one half. Okay, that's all well and good. Let's consider some mixed states. Of course, one consequence of quantum set is that pure states no longer have probability one of some certain thing happening, right? These probabilities are now intrinsic parts of even the pure state itself. So even though I just took pure states, I didn't find that they had some probability, or uh, sorry, I didn't find that they had some sure probability of a certain thing happening necessarily, at least not with respect to a different basis, a different measurement basis. So let's consider some mixed states. For instance, Let's take a mixed state row, and it's just going to be half row zero plus half row one. Or equivalently, right, it's a matrix one half zero, zero, one half. Okay. So ostensibly, these are the same situation that we had with row plus over there, right? I'm saying that I have a one half chance of observing row zero. Or I have a one half chance of observing that pure state, and I have a one half chance of observing the pure state at one. But of course, these aren't quite the same. If I do this new row times row zero, I do still find, after taking my probability via the trace, that I have one half. But there's something a little bit fishy here, right? That's a pure state. This is a mixed state. This mixed state represents a lack of information. That pure state represents the maximal amount of information it's possible to have. And yet both cases claim that a measurement of, say, spin up and spin down both have probability one half. Okay? But we know that that shouldn't be quite right. And another sort of fishy aspect that we try to apply the classical reasoning to this is that by the sort of traditional entropy, which I denoted A H earlier, each of these would have entropy one bit. So H rho has entropy one bit, H rho zero has entropy one bit, but only in the classical sense. So not in the proper sense I'm about to introduce. So if I tried to apply my classical information theoretic machinery to this, it seems like this pure and this mixed state have the same amount of information. And so that doesn't accurately reflect the physical scenario as we know it, as we can empirically observe, observe it. So now we move on to the quantum notion of entropy, von Neumann entropy. Interestingly, von Neumann entropy predates the entropy I introduced earlier, sometimes called the Shannon entropy, introduced by Claude Shannon at Bell Labs when he was trying to quantify communication errors and losses. Um, von Neumann was actually the one who suggested to Claude Shannon to call his other quantity entropy. So I think that's just an interesting little historical bit. But this version of entropy really precedes it. It's really inspired by the original notion of entropy and thermodynamics. Von Neumann entropy, which for now I'll abbreviate H sub Vn, take some density matrix rho corresponding just like always to some probability distribution. And I take negative trace of rho ln rho. So this is a pretty natural extension of the classical sense of entropy as we were using it. Right? I said earlier that. 
natural log one over something was sort of maybe the more intuitive way to approach the entropy, but I was going to pop the negative out pretty quickly. And taking the trace of some density matrix against something is how we evaluate the probabilities in general. So just like before, we're evaluating the probabilities against the information content, so to say, still representing it with a natural log, but now it's the natural log of a matrix. Now it's a logic natural log applied to some density matrix. But this new notion of entropy, uh, this, this captures exactly the intuition we want to capture where the pure states have no information and the mixed states have some non-zero amount of information. And it's four o'clock. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there's a people waiting. You can still kind of. Okay, yeah, I'll wrap it up because this is wrap it up and then that's right. fine. Okay. So, <laughs> well, I'll just copy down some of the calculations, right? So, my matrix was diagonalized. So, taking the natural log of it's easy, just natural log of the diagonal elements. I'm using the row I had before with one half, one half on the diagonal. So, minus LN2, minus LN2. I take row natural log of that. And then I take that down via the trace. And, you know, in this case, everything's a natural log. So it's a little bit messier. It's not quite the nicest numbers we might want to have, but negative one half natural log two, or sorry, two negatives. They're going to cancel. I knew that. We all know that two negatives cancel. So in this case, I find that my mixed state has information. One half ln2 plus one half ln2. And again, I can take scalar multiples of this. So I can think of this as log base two, log base two, and I still have one bit of information, just like I had in the other sense. But instead, if I calculate this same thing, we're running out of time. I'll just say if I take, for instance, P or row zero, row one, row plus, any one of those, and I take my von Neumann entropy, I find that they have information content zero which is what I expected to have. It's what I expect to have in a pure state. I expect all the information to sort of already be determined. So there's no more information to get by doing an experiment, at least not in the sense of finding out more about the pure state. Of course, you know, the experiment is still probabilistic called its quantum mechanics, but this accurately reflects that the, the pure state itself does not have any more information available to gain. Whereas this mixed state, which ostensibly is just the same probability distribution on the same measurements, is truly a different state with a different information content and, of course, different empirical outcomes. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'll stop there then for the morning. It's over. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, so thank you very much, Howie. So, I, I try to get here to the picture. Uh, are there some one or two? Um, quick questions. No, or yes, yeah. Um, Please loud. We we. Okay. Um, yeah. So for the Gleason theorem, mm -hmm. um, so for uh, in public space of dimensionality, um, like uh, uh, less than or equal to three, right? greater or equal to oh, dimension H greater. Okay, but we can still like, define some row. It doesn't follow for any. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't follow that we can't construct new probability measures yeah. that's slight, that are slightly different than just assigning it to the trace of row time something. And, and that happens across quantum mechanics and two level systems. Um, Kalkin Specker, Bell's, Bell's theorem, et cetera. All these things tend to fail in the two dimensional case, but they don't fail very hard. And yeah, it's immediately like, I mean, you know, we're never going to consider just a single two qubit, like one qubit, two level case. We're going to Left to two qubits and things like that, and then immediately disappears. Yeah. David has a question uh, yes. online. David. Hi. Um, so I, I understand that you know what you have calculated here is the entropy that is of the state that you know you have, and what I'm wondering about is, given that there's a possibility for multiple states in the first place, multiple pure states, how does that possibility layer on top of this? I, I, I apologize if this is a very naive question. No, it's not It's not a naive question. Um, I, didn't, I didn't explicate it the way I should have, but this mixed state here, for instance, is one where I uh, don't know the pure state I'm in. If I knew that I have a 50% chance of being in pure state zero, 
one half chance of being in pure state one. That's exactly the calculation I did over here. Uh -huh. so in general, I could say, you know, maybe it's a 10 level system and there's 10 different um, measurements in this sort of uh, orthogonal basis. And I don't know which one I'm in. Maybe I have a one tenth chance. So I would just take a 10 by 10 matrix and slap one tens all the way down the diagonal. And uh -huh. I, think I get this same sort of result where often we find that this entropy, like I said here, if I, if I switch to log base two instead of natural log, I get the exact same entropy I had in the classical case by just considering the probabilities. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So, uh, let, thanks, let me thank Howie again and uh, all the questions. I suggest that we continue this discussion because there is a follow up event right now. And uh, please, uh, if you have questions which come up, send it to me and uh, we will have a series of lectures on, and, and talks on, on the topic. Yeah, so um, um, we will continue. Thank you. And next week, David, will you speak next week or um, will that be postponed? I can do that. Pardon? I can do that. Although I think I need, I'll, I'll want to get some advice from you. Okay, we'll talk about this today or tomorrow. By, okay, by, great. So, thank, great. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Really, just certain properties of the atom. Like if I have one atom, it's spin.